It's April 2018, and Panzu Baminga, a Dutch citizen, is at Eindhoven Airport in the Netherlands. He's returning from Rome after giving a lecture on human rights. He's waiting patiently in line with the other returning passengers. Then, he's pulled out of the line by the Dutch border police, the Marechise. Panzu Baminga was smartly dressed, behaving in a totally normal way. Nothing made him stand out from any other business traveler that day. And he's not only a citizen, he's also a well-respected politician in Eindhoven. But, born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mr. Baminga is not white. They decided to take Mr. Baminga out of the row because he fit the profile of a Nigerian money smuggler. The human rights situation is worsening globally and that is why it's important that we hold all those accountable that violate human rights. Islam is the real problem that we face in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of Europe. The independence of the judges in Hungary is one of the best in the European Union. (laughs) We need the tripod of democracy, respect for human rights and respect for the rule of law. In this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast, we'll explore a legal case that could have far-reaching consequences for the use of ethnic profiling in the EU. Later, I'll talk to Israel Butler about how campaigners and activists can be more successful in convincing people against the use of ethnic profiling. What happened to Mr. Bemenga on that April day three years ago was not something new to him. For him, this was the, well, um, time he was taken out of the row. It always, almost always happens to him. That's the voice of Jelle Kloss, whom you heard in the episode's intro. He's the litigation director for the Public Interest Litigation Program, a part of the Dutch section of the International Commission of Jurists, or NJCM. Jelle says that despite Mr. Bominga's familiarity with what was happening, he still didn't understand why it was happening. Then he noticed something. When he looked around, so he could see the looks of the other passengers, but he also saw that uh, there were other people also being taken out of the row um, that were also non-white, uh, that, that had a black skin color. So the first thing that Mr. Babenga did was ask the border policeman, he was, um, uh, yeah, who, who just addressed him, on what's going on here. Can you see what's happening? Um, it looks like it's all only people with a black skin color and non-white people are being taken out of the row. And the border police, military police actually, uh, said something like, well, this is something we can do. We have the power to do this. We're, we're looking for refugees and terrorists. So yeah, this is just in our power to, to do. Yella says the admission by Demarche say that they use ethnic profiling and consider it lawful elevated attention to the case beyond what had been given to previous incidents of ethnic profiling. There was a famous uh, a rapper that was, um, well, his car was put aside because he, he, he was uh, driving while black in, in, in a uh, too expensive car, according to the police. Um, so there was already a lot of discussion on ethnic profiling and racial profiling. And I think the trigger with, with Mr. Bamenga was... Um, that the border police or the, the Marseillais said, we are allowed to use ethnicity or race as one of the elements in our profiles. And also the Dutch government said that. Mr. Bermingo was released after a check of his identity documents. He started tweeting about what had happened to him. Pretty soon there was media coverage and it became a topic of conversation in pubs and homes across the country. Dutch MPs started asking questions on the floor of Parliament. But the legal case did not happen in a vacuum. For years, rights groups had been working to stop ethnic profiling by Dutch authorities. NJCM, Amnesty International, Control-Alt-Delete, and the anti-discrimination group Radar joined together, along with Mr. Bermenga and another individual, to bring the ethnic profiling case against the Dutch state. The discovery phase and sworn statements from border police officers were a boon to Yale's case. The suit against the Marishise gave his team access to internal documents that were both implicating and disturbing. By doing the complaint against the border police, we got access to a lot of internal um, uh, policy documents, but also we got to see the people that 
um, read the statements by the border policemen themselves on how they think um, yeah, ethnic profiling works and what it is and what it's not. One of the border police uh, people that was uh, that gave a statement said, we know how refugees look like. Uh, that's our expertise we, and our experience. I can pick them out of the row. And I think that's very interesting that you from afar can look at someone and know that they are a refugee. And by myself, I thought, well, that they must not be thinking about uh, the Edward Snowdens of this uh, world uh, and the Julian Assange's, but uh, another type of individual. Um, what we also f saw, and I think that was very critical for our case, is we found out what the risk model was that made them take Mr. Mpansu out of the row that day. They decided to take Mr. Bamenga out of the row because he fit the profile of a Nigerian money smuggler. It's one of many profiles the Dutch authorities have created to describe potential criminals or other persons of interest. And the Marchese lists certain behaviors that fit this profile. So they were looking at people flying from Italy um, that were dressed in a suit, had a suitcase, were walking fast and had a non-Dutch appearance. That was the official risk profile that they used that day. Walking fast, wearing a suit and carrying a briefcase. This could fit countless occupations. It was clear to Jelle and his team that the determining characteristic was a non-Dutch appearance. And I think it was also, well, uh, shocking for me at least to see the complaint commissioner, the, the, the chair of the complaint commission at the Ministry of Defense, uh, where we in first instance came with this complaint, stated to Mr. Bomenga, yeah, but let's be real, you do not look like a Dutch person. Uh, you fit the profile. You are, you have a non-Dutch appearance. And uh, yeah, I think this is very shocking because for more than 300 years, at least more than 300 years, there are uh, black uh, Dutch citizens. So the fact that Mr. Mampanso is not seen, is perceived as being non-Dutch, it's only because of his skin color. In the Netherlands, if you bring a case on a public interest topic, you need to give the state or other defendant a last chance to correct the wrong and avoid trial. So the two sides had a final meeting. So we had a meeting with a lot of professionals at the Ministry of Defense, I think, again. And there was also this one guy working on a higher level for the for the Conor Commercial for the Border Police. And he, he was just giving a lot of examples on why what they are doing is not an ethnic profile. One of the things I thought was very interesting that they said, well, you have ethnic profiling and you have ethnic profiling and the ethnic profiling we're doing is not the ethnic profiling you're talking about. The officer gave a familiar example, young Nigerian women who are sex trafficked to Europe. To save these women and girls, a profile has been created, a young woman traveling alone and a Nigerian appearance. And then I asked, I just plainly asked in that meeting, how does a Nigerian look like? Um, and then, because we already said it's not about nationality, yeah? right? Because this is a check that they have before they've seen the passports. So they do not know who is Nigerian and who is a Dutch citizen. This is purely on, on appearances. And then this guy from the Marseille started exp giving a biological explanation of how he thought the average Nigerian looked like and, and what kind of a... Um, he started describing the average face of a... Um, of a, a West African person and with, with the, about the, talking about cheekbones and stuff like this. The Marche backed by the Dutch government, refused to disavow the use of ethnic profiling in their work. The case went to trial. And while the plaintiffs would have preferred to resolve matters pre-trial, Yella says it's the sort of case that human rights lawyers like himself dream about. I mean, I think this is an awesome case because, I mean, this is the case, the kind of case you want to do when, when you start uh, doing this job. But also, legally speaking, it's very great because the case is very clear cut. So there's a very little fuzz and very little discussion on the facts uh, because this, the state and the border police in the case just uh, state that indeed um, they think ethnicity can be uh, a element. It's as long as it's not the defining element. The facts of the case were straightforward, and so was the question posed to the court. If ethnicity is just one of the elements of a profile, is it still ethnic profiling? 
To make his case, Yale sought to define the problem clearly, using what had happened to the two citizen clients as, quote, illustrations for the judge. This is what happens in practice. He also presented evidence from discovery and sworn statements. And he presented supporting case law, both from Dutch and European courts. His team is asking the judges to deliver a statement of law that says using ethnicity in risk profiling is a violation against the prohibition of discrimination. Yella feels confident in his case, especially after hearing the arguments put forward by the state in defense of ethnic profiling. They have said a lot of things, um, a few stupid things in my opinion, like one of their arguments is it doesn't really happen that often. Um, these argue, these, there are so little complaints. So if so, so, so few people complain, then apparently it isn't such a big problem. Um, the two clients that we have in the case are, are um, exceptions and not uh, the rule. Well, I think that's a very problematic point of view because we just had a big report by the National Ombudsman that stated that a lot of people that face discrimination and ethnic profiling do not complain because they have the feeling it doesn't help. And I think in the Netherlands, if you just talk to people that are non-white that travel, um, you, you would seriously harm yourself if you state this is not happening. I mean, you, you would embarrass yourself. I mean, um, I mean, black people, the people of color, non-white people know this happens a lot. If you are in Schiphol Airport, just look around. You can see it happening that they will take people that do not look Dutch um, in, in the opinion of the border police uh, out of the role more often than... Uh, white people. Yella even uses one of the arguments of the defense team to show how it actually makes his point. They try to make an abstract of why using ethnicity as one of the elements is not a problem. And they use the example of the blue um, Opel uh, cadets uh, or Ford Escorts. I think it's Ford Escorts, the blue Ford Escorts built between 2005 and 2015. So they say, so let's imagine that the police has information that criminals, a specific gang of criminals, only uses blue Ford Escorts built between 2005 and 2015. Well, I think it's, it's a stretch because why would they? But let's just indeed think, okay, that they use this. Then the police will only, or the border police will only take out of the road blue Ford Escorts between, uh, built between 2005 and 2015. So the state says, look, here, the color blue is just one of the elements. It's absolutely not the defining element to take a car out, out of the row or to, 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 pay, to put it beside the street. Um, because all other brands and, and, and all other Ford Escorts that were built before 2005 or after 2015, they can just drive through. And, and we thought, well, but all red Ford Escorts built in between 2005 and 2015 and all yellow ones and all black ones they can also continue so within the group of fort escorts built between 2005 and 2015 only the blue ones because they are blue will be taken out of the row and so within that category that is, color is the defining element and the same is true with, with uh, the examples that we saw in our real life cases. In other words, people wearing a suit, carrying a briefcase, and walking fast, but not matching the Marachisei's conception of a Nigerian, were not pulled aside that day in Eindhoven Airport. The defining element between all these men and Mr. Mapanzo Bamanga is the fact that he did not have a, a Dutch appearance, whatever that may be. And it's important to remember that this is not the profiling of suspected criminals, it's profiling everyone. And that's a big distinction. We're not talking about perpetrators uh, or about um, uh, suspects. So if in Italy, Rome airport, there is a black man in red trousers that uh, threatened uh, someone at the airport or threw in a window, then a flight from that airport to Amsterdam, of course, it's no problem if they take out of the row all out of the row all black men wearing red trousers. Then it's not a problem to use ethnicity because it's part of the suspect. You are looking for someone that you know that did something. 
But when you're talking about risk profiles, there are no suspects. You are just looking at people looking like this, have a bigger chance of being criminals, terrorists, or whatever. And then using ethnicity or perceived nationality is very scary, very discriminatory, and you should stay away as far as possible from it. So what about the verdict? We'll find out together. It will be announced through a live stream on September 22nd. An interest from all parts of Europe would make sense. The case could have big implications for the use of ethnic profiling, not only in the Netherlands, but across the EU. If we win the case, um, it will be won based on uh, legal grounds that apply to the whole of Europe. Um, so I think um, that could be very helpful because, unfortunately, the Netherlands is not unique um, on this uh, ethnic profiling issue. I, d I do think the Netherlands is one of the only countries where they have it so specifically, um, this strange argument that you can use it as long as it's not the sole argument, sole element. Uh, so I hope the implications legally will be big. But even with a positive court decision, Yella stresses that nothing will change overnight. We will not change this problem with this verdict. What we hopefully will do is empower the people um, like Mr. Mapanzu, who is uh, in, in our pilot. They are not just the victims in our case. They are our allies. Uh, we are their allies. Um, they they play a very important role in the case. They claim their rights as citizens. They say, we also pay taxes. We do not want to be discriminated against. If we win and they win, other people of color in the Netherlands will see, hey, it is, you also have civil rights that you can call upon. Um, you should not uh, do nothing uh, if, if, if you are treated like this. You should fight back. Um, of course, go to the streets, join Black Lives Matter protests, etc. But you can also file in complaints and, and use the legal route um, because you are also a citizen of this country and you also should make use of, of those rights. Campaigning, joining protests, speaking out against ethnic profiling. Regardless of the outcome of the case in the Netherlands, people there and elsewhere will need to continue the fight against this form of discrimination outside of the courtroom. But campaigns to end ethnic profiling have not always been as successful as hoped. Some people are persistent in their belief in the efficacy of ethnic profiling, or in their deference to law enforcement's opinion. A new guide on how to communicate about ethnic profiling suggests we may have been doing it wrong. By promoting certain arguments against ethnic profiling, campaigners may in fact be further entrenching support for it. My next guest is Israel Butler, the author of that guide. He's also the head of advocacy for the Civil Liberties Union for Europe and gives trainings on values-based framing. It's a form of communication that allows campaigners, activists, and others to communicate with people in a way that is persuasive because it appeals to the values they already hold and share with others. Israel, welcome back to Speechbag. Thanks very much. It's nice to be back. Your guide talks about the importance of communicating within the framework of a set narrative, a line of reasoning to frame communications on ethnic profiling. And you propose two, but they share a common construction. And I'm curious if this basic structure is kind of the template for campaigners and activists when trying to create their own persuasive narrative. Yeah, it's a, a, a great question. Um, so communications experts who promote causes uh, related to social justice or human rights or environmental protection, uh, they found that if you want to persuade someone to agree with your cause, then your argument should have certain ingredients and follow a certain structure. So there's, there's a kind of formula, uh, if you like. Um, and you need to start by telling your audience what you stand for. So what do you think the world should look like? Um, what is it that you are promoting? Um, and you need to explain this in a way that connects to what people value and find important. So in effect, you're actually reminding them of what their vision of the world is. Um, I refer to this as a value statement and it's step one in a narrative. Um, and as you mentioned in the guide, we set out two alternative narratives uh, and they have two different value statements. One of those reminds people that we find it important to be free to go about our daily business and treat each other with respect. 
And the other one reminds people that we find it important to have a sense of community where people know and support each other. That's step one. Step two is your explanation of the problem. Here's where you tell people that reality is out of line with what they value. So you're creating some kind of dissonance. Now, in our context, this is where you say that those of us from certain ethnic minorities are not able to enjoy this freedom to go about their daily lives or are not able to enjoy this sense of community. Why? Because those of us from certain minorities are stopped, searched, questioned by the police just because of the color of our skin. And that's what we call ethnic profiling. Now, in step two here, you don't just set out the problem. You also need to tell them who is doing what to cause that problem. So here's where you'd explain why ethnic profiling happens and how it connects to systemic racism. Um, and in the guide, we look at different ways of doing this, but to give you just one example, one of the things we suggest is you could say, ethnic profiling is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The police have decided to base their policy to use ethnic profiling on a stereotype. And then they justify that policy by pointing to distorted statistics that they've created using the very same stereotype policy. The only thing that crime figures tell us is that police are policing ethnic minorities instead of policing crime. Now your audience sees that there's a problem that goes against their values and they understand why the problem is happening. So they're ready for step three, which is where you explain your solution. For example, changing the way we assess how police perform by basing it on feedback from communities rather than arrest targets, or making police keep track of and assess who they stop and why, or training the police so that they only use their powers where there's objective evidence of a crime. So that's step three. And then there's the final step. Here you have a call to action because you want people to do something, right? That could be to sign a petition or it could just be to share content. And in step four, you also want to remind people of past times where by pulling together, we achieve some kind of social justice win. So it could be, you know, something in recent history, like getting paid holidays or the right to equal treatment at work. The idea behind this is to overcome citizen, uh, sorry, overcome cynicism, because people are often ready to agree with you that there's a problem that needs solving, but they often think that it's impossible to change things for the better. So you have to remind them that change is possible when we work together. Um, so that's the, the basic structure of a narrative and, and why we follow that pattern. As said earlier, your guide does propose two uh, narratives. You call them the community narrative and the freedom and respect narrative. Could you explain each one and what about them makes them potentially effective in changing minds about ethnic profiling? Yeah. Um, so there are basically three groups of people in society. There are people who are predisposed to support what I call progressive causes like equality, civil liberties, environmental protection. Let's call them our base. On the other side, you've got people who are predisposed to support authoritarian causes like inequality and racism. And then there's a group in the middle and we call them swayables or the movable middle. And they will shift towards progressive or authoritarian attitudes depending on what kind of messaging they get. Now, broadly speaking, people who endorse things like equality and social justice, so our base, has a particular worldview. They think that most people are essentially decent and mostly good to each other. And from this flow other ways of thinking, like that human beings should take care of each other and our habitat. People with this mindset don't think of differences between people as something to be scared of. Rather, they think they're irrelevant or interesting even. People with this mindset also think that we should all have control over our own lives and how we're governed and be free and supported to excel. Now, if you want people to support a progressive cause, then you need to stimulate this mindset in your base and also in that movable middle or swayable audience. And this is what your value statement is for. Um, so yeah, the guide suggests two alternative ways of doing this. 
either by reminding your audience that most of us prize our freedom to move around in our daily lives, or by reminding them that most of us really value the idea of li living in a community where people know and support each other. And when you make this the focus of the conversation around ethnic profiling, then a certain logic flows. The, the freedom narrative steers people towards thinking that the job of the police is to be there to help us enjoy our freedom and that they should be there for us to turn to when we need them, knowing that they will treat us with respect. And the community narrative steers people towards thinking that the role of the police is to be part of our community life for us to know each other and for them to support us when we have issues that we need their help with. And that's the main difference between those two narratives. They explain the problem and the solution in, in fairly similar ways. Reading your guide, one of the things that was really interesting for me that really stood out was that you warn against focusing on the harms of ethnic profiling uh, for the victims. And you also say that we shouldn't focus on the inefficiencies of ethnic profiling. And the reason I thought this was curious was because these are two extremely common approaches by campaigners against ethnic profiling. Um, but why, in your opinion, is this the wrong way to go about it? Why don't they work and why should they be avoided? One of the reasons that the public isn't more outraged at ethnic profiling is because many people believe in an entirely false stereotype that's been pushed for decades by the media and many politicians. Um, and they believe often in that stereotype subconsciously. And this stereotype is that certain minorities commit a lot of crime compared to the majority population. Um, and one of the things that allows people to believe this lie is that many people see ethnic minorities as different, as a separate group, not part of who we consider to be us. And it's much easier to believe negative things about people who are not like me. Now, what our opponents do is say, hey, there are these people who are not like us and they commit crime, so they're threatening and we should be tough on them. But what activists tend to say is, hey, look at these poor people over here, they're not like us and that makes them vulnerable. And look at how they're being harmed, we should help them. So even though progressive activists are trying to sort out the situation, they're still perpetuating this them and us thinking. It's not so much that talking about the harm is bad, it's partly that talking about the harm without making your audience realize that the minority in question is part of us, is just like us, is the same as us. So we need to remind people of our shared humanity. That's kind of the, the, the problem when we talk about harm. The other issue when we talk about harm is that we tend to put it right at the front of our communications. So we often just focus our communications about the problem. Um, and this tends to make people shut down. It tends to make them less receptive uh, to understanding that uh, something can be done, that the world can be a different place. Now, so one of the things that we need to do when we talk about harms is think about uh, appealing to empathy, creating empathy by, by reminding people of their shared humanity. But we also need to remind people of our shared fate. Okay, so we also need to point out how harm to a person from whatever background is damaging to our society as a whole. For example, by pointing out that most people look out for each other and lend a hand when they see someone in need, but profiling creates distrust between us based on the color of our skin, and that tears at the bonds that tie society together. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, this uh, argument that we often hear that profiling is inefficient. So this argument goes like this. What we're saying is, because the level of criminality is actually pretty much the same across the whole of society, police are throwing away resources by focusing disproportionate attention on people from a particular minority. And if the police focus too many resources in the wrong place, it means they're gonna be missing all of the crime that's going on in the majority population. So essentially what we're saying is they're wasting money by looking in the wrong place and they're making society less safe because there's all this crime going on that they're not seeing. And I think this argument can work if you're speaking specifically to the police, if you're trying to persuade a police force. 
who probably care about how many people they're catching and how much crime is going unsolved. And it could probably work if you were speaking directly to politicians on the right of the political spectrum, who are much more obsessed with security and public spending. The thing is, this isn't a message you want to broadcast to everyone if you're campaigning. And that's because it emphasizes a worldview that the world is a dangerous place. And when you trigger that way of thinking, it doesn't actually make people supportive of things like equality. It makes people more likely to endorse restrictions on our freedoms and look at outsiders suspiciously. So instead, it's much better to move the conversation away from crime and security onto something else, like how important our freedom is or how important our ability to support each other in our communities is. A lot of people who could potentially be persuaded against ethnic profiling are tripped up by common sense understandings that they hold. For example, many people assume that police generally do do good work uh, and are fair, or that ethnic minorities really are more likely than white people to be involved in criminal activity. So how do campaigners or do campaigners confront these prevailing assumptions when trying to change minds on ethnic profiling, either directly, head on, or at least in passing? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it can actually be quite difficult to recognize that our opponents do have a narrative because, as you say, their way of framing the issue has become so embedded in mainstream culture that it's become, you know, quote unquote, common sense. Um, look, our opponents are essentially trying to stimulate authoritarian worldviews. So researchers have found two worldviews underpin the thinking of people who endorse authoritarian attitudes. One is that the world is a dangerous place. So these people are really quick to think that their security or their culture or religion or economic stability is under threat and that it's under threat from people who they regard as not like them. And the other authoritarian worldview is that the world is a competitive jungle. And these people believe that there's a natural hierarchy in society with religion at the top above humanity, whites above non-whites, men above women, uh, straights above gays, adults above children, humanity above nature. And they want to keep these traditional hierarchies in place. So the narrative that authoritarians push is that we all value safety and security and that people from certain ethnic minorities are dangerous because they're involved in crime. And this narrative will trigger these worldviews. Uh, it either triggers the view that the world is a dangerous place and this group is threatening, or it triggers the view that this minority group has to be kept in its place through, for example, criminal sanctions. Now, one of the problems that we face is that this false link between crime and a given minority is constantly reinforced. It's, it's reinforced by a bias in media reporting that over-reports uh, crime committed by people who are not white. It's reinforced by politicians, uh, often on the right, far right of the political spectrum. And traditionally, activists have tried to break this stereotype by using myth busting, you know, by showing actually that levels of criminality are the same across the whole of society. There is not one group that is more prone to criminality than the other. The problem is that we know that myth busting doesn't work. So people will question your statistics or question whether you're telling the truth. So instead you've got to change the way that people think about the people from ethnic minorities you're talking about. It's easier to see another group as threatening when you don't recognize that they're essentially the same as you. So if they don't see that all people have similar hopes and dreams. So, what we suggest is that rather than attacking the stereotype directly, rather than trying to correct it with statistics, it's actually better to pull out the foundations from under this, the stereotype. And you do that by emphasizing our shared humanity and our shared fate in society, which I just uh, mentioned earlier. Now, as for this idea that a lot of people assume that the police do a good job and are fair, this is gonna vary from country to country, of course. But what we do know is that if the police are generally respected by your target audience, then your audience is more likely to think that either profiling doesn't exist or that it's a problem that's caused by a few isolated bad apples. And that's a problem for campaigners because we need to show that it's something that's baked into the system. 
And we also know that if the police command a lot of respect in, among our audience, then it's very easy for, to, to, for the police to get our audience to side with them in a debate over ethnic profiling. Because often what our, audience, what our opponents do is to frame uh, this debate about ethnic profiling as a, a false binary choice. So they, what they say is you're either pro-police or you're pro-banning ethnic profiling. So you, our opponents will try to paint an attack on ethnic profiling as an attack on the police in general. And there are two things that we need to do to get around this. One is to explain how structural racism is baked into the system and rewards racist policies like ethnic profiling. So we take the attention away from a few bad individual officers and direct it at kind of the system in which they work. And we give examples of how to explain that in the guide. And the other thing that we need to do when we explain our solutions, we frame them as things that actually improve policing by helping our police forces better serve our communities or by helping us better enjoy our freedoms. That's it for this episode of the Speechback Podcast by Liberties. It's a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe, an EU-wide watchdog that works to promote and protect the rights of everyone in the European Union. 